Hi everyone and welcome to part 7 of my Z80 computer series. In this series of videos I'm attempting to design my own retro 8-bit computer based around the Z80 CPU. I've reached a point on the training board that I've been building where I need to add some form of input but before I look at that I want to refocus on the original goal of building a full featured general purpose computer and not just the trainer board that we see here. Now a lot has happened since the last video and I want to bring you up to speed with what I've been looking at. Firstly there is the input device. On the trainer board this will probably just be a few push buttons. But on the final computer this will be a full keyboard. So I've been thinking about how I'm going to do that because I want to incorporate that into the case design. So we'll look at my ideas in a bit. Still thinking about input, I ordered a buffer chip, but it seems I've purchased the wrong one. So at some point we should have a look at that mistake and talk a bit about the differences in the, in the different chips. Next, it's been getting a, a little tedious hand compiling the programs and feeding them into the Tommy Prom programmer one byte at a time. If I want to get serious and ramp up my progress, I need to do two things. Firstly, I need to start using an assembler program that will automatically compile the Z80 mnemonics into machine code bytes. But secondly, I need to be able to flash the whole ROM chip in one go so that I don't have to type in one byte at a time. Finally, I have started to receive some comments in some of the videos. Now this is great because it shows me that there is some interest in this and it tells me what you like and dislike about the videos so far. Two people have reached out to me asking for PCBs for the Tommy Prom. So there is one left available if anybody wants one. Please remember it's only offered to people in the UK for postage reasons and it's only the PCB, no components. There were two comments that I'll try to address. Firstly, someone mentioned that I forgot to talk about variables in my last video, to which I initially replied that there is no concept of variables in Z80 assembly language, which is kind of true. You won't find any mention of variables in the Z80 manual or any of the Z80 instructions. We only have registers and memory to work with. However, that said, it makes me realize that such concepts start to emerge as you add more layers of abstraction to our programs. We start with very low level concepts such as working with registers, basic logic and arithmetic, conditional jumps, etc. But then we start using an assembler program and we can start to introduce the concept of labels. These are just human readable labels that we use when writing the assembly language program that just point to memory locations. So they're just labels for memory addresses. So we don't have to remember the particular memory address, we just need to remember the name of the label. We can use the DB assembler directive to assign locations in memory. Then we can start to use these labels a bit like variables. However, these are not really variables. We can't do arithmetic directly on them. For example, if we had a label called age, we can't do things like age equals age plus 10, or even ink age comma 10. We would have to first load the value from the label into a register, then perform the manipulation, and then write the value back to the memory location pointed to by the label. Next, there was a couple of comments indicating that perhaps there were some gaps in my knowledge, pointing out a valid example and asking, if, if, if I was not an expert, why was I teaching all of my viewers? Well, clearly I'm not an expert, and yes, there are gaps in my knowledge. This is my first attempt at a project like this, which makes me a beginner. Even though I've been working with computers and programming for over 35 years, we can't all know everything. I have some basic electronics knowledge, but I'm by no means an expert. The purpose of these videos is not to teach you how to do this, but simply to share my progress, a bit like a video blog. And hopefully there might be some points that some viewers might find interesting. But I welcome the feedback and I'll take it on board. All comments are good and valuable, be it positive or negative, it's all good. Now coming back to the assembler, I've been looking at ASM80.com. 
This will generate a binary file for me that I should be able to feed into the Tommy Prom with a single command. Here I hit some problems. I didn't seem to be able to push the binary file into the Tommy Prom programmer. There is a command to write a file in the Tommy Prom, but you need to start the file transfer separately, and it took me a while to figure that out. I'm running on a Mac, so I can only show you how I got my setup working. If you're using Windows, you might need a slightly different solution. First I installed the LRZSZ software using Brew. Now this is a small suite of programs that can send and receive file transfers using the X, Y or Z modem protocols. To send the file to the Tommy prompt, we need to use the X modem protocol. I've changed from using the Serial Tools application to using the Screen program, which seems to be installed on a Mac by default. This allows me to use all the Tommy Prom commands as before, but also allows me to start the file transfer. So I would press W and hit Enter to write a file. Then I press Control A, then press colon, then type exec bang bang lsx dash b dash x, and then the path to my file. So the dash b is to say that this is a binary file, and the dash X is to say we want the X modem protocol. Then we press enter. Then at this point I hit a snag because the file transfer seemed to complete, but my program was not on the EEPROM. So I reached out to Tom Nisbet, who created the Tommy Prom, and he was kind enough to help me. After some back and forth with our conversation, I finally realized that I was trying to send a 64K program to a 32K EEPROM. I was quite embarrassed and that I'd wasted Tom's time with such a beginner mistake, but he seemed happy that I'd finally got it working. So to fix the issue, I had to add a compiler directive to my Z80 program in the ASM80 assembler. This tells the compiler that I want a 32K binary file. So I'm happy that I have both a solution for writing larger assembly programs using ASM80 and that I can use the screen program along with the lsx command to burn the whole EEPROM in one hit. So it feels like I'm making progress. So that's all the things that have been happening since the last video. So let's turn our attention back to the original goal of designing and building a whole computer. I think it's quite important to keep reminding myself of what the overall goal is. So these were my original goals. I won't dwell on these. If if you want to read them you can pause the video but the thing I want to point out is the integrated keyboard now most Z80 retro projects you'll see online use an external keyboard with a serial interface usually using a PS2 connector these have their own controllers for the keyboard now these controllers are usually more powerful and more modern than the Z80 itself and it feels a bit out of place for a retro design I don't want to do this. I'm aiming for a more primitive approach of using the Z80 itself to control the keyboard. Now I know this will be limiting the design a lot and it will probably be much more difficult, but it's my choice, it's my design, and that's what I want to do. I might regret it and I welcome your thoughts. So if we take a look at the ZX Spectrum Plus 3, now this was the the second computer I ever owned. I think the first was a Plus 2A and then I moved on to this Plus 3. And this is really the type of thing that I have in mind. A single device with an integrated keyboard, the Z80 controlling almost everything. And it comes on immediately when you switch the power on because the operating system is stored in ROM chips. The integrated keyboard is going to be quite a challenge. I'm going to have to design a case to incorporate it, which I want to 3D print. I've been thinking about this and I've started uh, mocking up a, a 3D design you can see here. Um, now this is very similar to the Spectrum Plus 3, so maybe I've copied things a little too closely. Um, it's slightly smaller than the, the Plus 3. Um, but I'm just playing around with ideas. I'm not exactly sure what I want to do, but hopefully it gives you kind of idea of what I'm thinking about. Now, there is actually a whole ecosystem out there for custom mechanical keyboards. So I thought maybe I could use some of those ideas and parts to build mine. 
I'm thinking of using mechanical keyboard key switches and then buy a keycap set. I don't want to 3D print the actual keys because I think that would just turn out terrible. I will 3D print a keyboard plate to snap the keys into and design a PCB for the keyboard that will have diodes. And maybe at some future point, if I could also have LEDs, which is not really in keeping with a retro design, but it would be a cool thing to play around with. So I've been looking around for a, a keycap set um, that would suit my requirements, that would give me the flexibility that I wanted to customise the keyboard. And it seemed like every set I found had some key missing. It's quite annoying, actually. But I think this set will work. I think it has everything I need. It's not quite perfect, but um, I think it's as close as I'm going to get. Now, I have some very specific requirements. Um, I want to keep the number of keys to the, an absolute minimum. Um, ideally, I want to be less than 64 keys or 64 or less keys. Um, so what I thought I would do is I would eliminate all these additional keys here and even get rid of um, the function keys because I very rarely use the function keys. I don't know about you, but on my, my keyboards, I very rarely use the function keys. And I think on a retro machine like this, we would use them even less. Um, but there are a few things that I do want. I do ideally want to keep the escape key and I definitely want to keep the cursor keys because I think this machine is going to be used mainly for programming. Um, it's really just going to be for playing around with, but I think we would just purely be programming on it. Um, and I think I'd really miss the cursor keys if they weren't there. But what I thought I'd try and do is try and incorporate these cursor keys and, and try and fit them in here somewhere into this, this main area. Um, if you look at the um, spectrum again, um, that's actually got two cursor keys on the left of the space bar and two cursor keys on the right of the space bar. So I thought I'd, I'd quite like to do it that way. Um, this is where I say this set wasn't quite perfect. Um, these cursor keys, I wish the symbols had been in the center of the keys. I think that would have looked better. Um, they're actually to the top left on every key. Um, not quite what I wanted, but I think it's good enough. And I was wondering, you know, can we put this key, can we move this down onto the bottom row? Because the keys on the different rows have uh, different profiles, and it tells us here the R numbers, which rows the keys um, belong in, for their correct profiles. And the first two rows are actually both the same, R1. So I believe we can move this key down onto the bottom row. So I think that will work. Um, the other specific requirement I had is I really want the, the pound symbol. Now, normally that sits on the number three key, but this is um, an ANSI layout keyboard, and it has the, the, the American pound symbol. The Americans call this symbol the pound symbol, but uh, in the UK we call this the hash symbol. And the pound symbol that we use is, is this one, um, our, our monetary symbol for the pound sterling. Um, so I really wanted that on the number three key. And normally what you do is you switch from an, uh, an ANSI layout to an ISO layout. Um, and the, the pound symbol comes up here. And the hash symbol goes down next to the enter key like it's shown here. You normally have this big enter key and the hash symbol goes there. So I'm going to make those changes. Put the number, um, swap out the number three key. Um, normally when you do that, you also swap out the number two key as well, but we'll, we'll look at that in a second. So I've checked sort of for all the keys and everything I need is here and it is in, they are in the right rows for what I want to do. So I'll talk you through um, what I was thinking. So I've got a keyboard layout editor here and I've got all the keys that I think I'm going to need. I've checked that um, they all exist in the correct rows. Um, I was particularly worried about this one. Um, I want this to go on row one. That is quite normal for it to go on row one, so it should exist. And I had a look and I saw oh, it's on row four. I thought that was going to be a problem. Um, but then they've got another one here on row two. But they've even got a third one here on row one. So this is the one we need. So I think we've got everything we need. 
So I'm going to start swapping out these keys. Uh, I'll delete the, the number three key. And we'll move this one in. That means we lose the hash symbol. Now the hash symbol normally sits here next to the enter key. So I'll swap out the enter key. We'll move this one here into position. And to use this enter key, we then also have to move the backslash key here. Um, which is, is this one here. Now normally what you do, normally that would uh, be removed. The enter key would go in and this key would normally be positioned over here. You would shrink the shift key down, shrink that down. And that key would normally sit in this position. But I actually don't like that. Um, I didn't like the way that looked. You kind of get this sort of cross between the keys and the, and the shift key has been made very small. And I just ugh, didn't like it. Um, and it made more sense to me. This shift key is actually even bigger. So it makes sense to reduce the size of this shift key and put this uh, backslash key over this side. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove this key. I'm going to replace it with this shift key. And we'll put that key in this position. And we'll return this shift key back to its standard size. So next I'll swap out the escape key. Um, because we put the, the hash symbol in this position, we get this... Um, tilde character here. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that, whether it's tilde or tilde. Um, but we actually have that key up here. So we don't really want two of them. And this is where I want to put the escape key. So that actually works out quite nicely. So I'll put the escape key in that position. I also think that key looks better in black. So we've got black all up the, the left hand side and, and all on the right hand side of black. I think that looks more balanced. Now normally when you're swapping out for an ISO layout, you would also swap out the number two key and the at symbol would um, move down here. And the double quote and the at symbol kind of swap positions. So I'll do that. We'll put the at symbol here. With this key. And the number two will be replaced with this one. So we've pretty much got a, a standard ISO layout here, but I've sort of swapped out the escape key and I've put this key on the right hand side of the keyboard rather than the left hand side of the keyboard. But other than that, it's pretty much an ISO layout. Um, so the last thing I want to do is try and squash these cursor keys in. Now, I, ideally, I wanted two here and two here. Um, I would be prepared to lose the, the code and the alt keys. I thought code was a little strange, but I think that's normally where the Windows key would go or the, the Apple key. Um, and I think they've tried to just make it standard and just call it code, which I thought was a little odd. So I'd be happy to lose those keys. Um, and, and we do have the function key here, so, so we, we've got another another spare key we could use um, but these these are smaller they don't really fit in these positions I played around with it and yeah I could do something by slightly shifting the spacebar key but it didn't work out so I'm going to leave this side as standard and I'm going to try and squash all four of these keys in in these positions so I'm going to lose these three keys here in fact what I'm going to do first I'm going to swap out this one to remove that one I'm going to put the function key on that side and I'm 
going to take these ones out. And I'm going to put these four keys in this position. So I think it's okay to bring this down onto the bottom row because it's still R1. Wasn't sure how I wanted to lay these out, whether we wanted to have left, up, down, or left, down, up, but I can I can play around with that later. This doesn't quite fit, so we need to push that key over a little bit. Um, so it almost works. And then the last thing to make it completely work is we need to shrink this key down. Now in this particular set, um, there was no control key with the, word, the full word control. Normally it is just CTRL anyway. Um, and I would actually prefer CTRL on, on both sides. But having a look in this set, I could only see CTRL, um, R1, CTRL. There's only one key because these have got the full word control and they're, they're larger size anyway. Um, and there is no other CTRL key for row one. So I think I'm gonna to have to stick with the full word control on that side and the smaller one can go in here. So a little bit of a compromise. The only thing I'm not happy with um, is pretty close to what I wanted. Ideally, I wanted two of these keys on this side, but that just didn't work out. Um, I would have preferred if the control key had the same wording on both sides. If it had been CTRL on both sides, I, I would have been happier with it. And I would have preferred these arrows to be in the center of the keys. I think they look better when they're positioned in the center than rather than being top left. And that was another reason why I decided to keep them all together on this side. Because I thought as they are all top left, it looks better if all the top left keys are sort of next to each other. Because these keys are, are, are centered, whereas these ones are sort of shifted slightly higher up the key. It's not quite what I wanted, but it's pretty close. It's pretty close to what I want. I think that is as close as I'm going to get. So that's the layout that I'm going with. Let me know what your thoughts are. If you would have done something different, it would be interested to hear what other people think. So we'll leave it there for now. Um, in the next video, I'll continue the theme of looking at the input. I'll be continuing on with this design of the full keyboard, as well as looking at the inputs for the trainer board. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.